Hello everybody, this is Matt from Megala Mobile, and welcome to part 4 of this mini-series Let's Make Solitaire in Unity. In part 3, we implemented mouse clicks, colliders, 2D raycasts, and the ability to sort through the remainder of the deck in chunks of 3. If you missed the previous episodes, I recommend checking them out first as we will pick up right where we left off. In this video, we will start managing card interactivity, allowing cards to be selected and implement the rules for stacking cards. As usual, all the scripts and Unity packages are available in the description, and the most recent version can be played in the browser. Let's crack on. When a player selects a card, there are several actions that could take place depending on what has been selected previously. This means that we need to know what is selected as well as what has been previously selected, which can cause a bit of a headache, but is certainly doable. To store what has previously been selected, we can create a new public game object, which I'm going to call slot1. As we also need to know what has previously been selected, we can pass the hit.collider.game object from the raycast2d to the card method as the argument game object selected. If the card clicked on is face down, and if the card is not blocked, it gets flipped over and enters play. If the card clicked on is in the deck pile with the trips and it is not blocked, then select it. If the card is face up and there is no card currently selected, then we should select the new card. If there is already a card selected and it is not the same card, then if the first card is eligible to stack on the second, it should stack on it, else the new card should be selected. Lastly, if there is already a card selected and it is the same card, then if the time between clicks was fast enough, it's a double click. And if there is an empty space in the top row that the card is eligible to stack into, it should automatically fly up there and do it. Then we can look at building out the functionality. For the situation where the card is face up and no card is currently selected, we can test the contents of slot one to see what's there. I originally made it null when a card was not selected, but it caused some reference exception errors down the line. To solve them, I've come up with an admittedly hacky solution that is not very elegant, but works. Instead of clearing slot 1 when a card is not currently selected, I just pass it the game object that the user input script is attached to. Therefore, if slot 1 is equal to this.gameObject, slot 1 becomes equal to the newly selected object provided by the raycast collision. I also set slot 1 to equal this game object in the start method. When a card is selected, I would like some feedback to the player. So over on the update sprite script, we can give it access to the user input script with private user input use input, then if the name of the card the update sprite script is attached to is equal to the name of the game object in slot 1, we update the sprite to be tinted yellow. Keeping this in the update method is expensive because this runs the check all the time, so if I was looking to refactor the code, I would make it so this is only happening when the card is clicked on instead of running every cycle, but this is fast and it works for now. If name is equal to user input dot slot one dot name, sprite renderer dot color equals color dot yellow. Else, sprite renderer dot color equals color dot white. We are then able to wrap it in an if statement that checks if there is something in the slot. If use input slot one. We also need to find the user input script in the start method. User input equals find object of type user input. Now if a card is selected, by clicking on it, it gets tinted yellow, but we can keep clicking despite a card having been previously selected. This is a bug as currently we should only be able to click on one card. Here, this should be a comparison. If slot one is equal to this game object, We'll save that, and excellent, that's now working as expected. Next, we cover what happens if there is already a card in slot 1 and it is different to the card selected, else if slot 1 is not equal to selected. If the first card is eligible to stack on the second, it should stack, else slot 1 equals selected. To test if a card is eligible to be stacked, I've created a bool method that takes in the selected game object, which I will call stackable, and which returns true if the card will stack and false if it will not. Within the stackable boolean method, we can create two variables of type selectable. S1 is the selectable script from slot 1, and S2 is the selectable script from the recently selected game object. Before we can determine if they are eligible to stack, we need to give the selectable script more information about the entity it has been placed on. Heading over to the selectable script, we can give it some extra variables. A public bool top, and we'll set that equal to false. A public string, suit. A public int value. A public int row. Public bool in deck pile, we'll set that equal to false to start with. And a private string, value string. At start, we can determine what the values are based on the name of the card. So first we check the tag to see if it is a card if compare tag card, then we make the suit string the letter at the first location of the string. suit equals transform.name at location 0 to string. We then build a quick string comprised of the remaining characters in the string called value string. This wouldn't be necessary if 10 wasn't a double digit number, but we'll make do. For int i equals 1, and i is less than the transform.name.length, increment i. char c equals transform.name at location i, value string equals value string plus c 
dot two string. Then, depending on the contents of the value string, an integer value is assigned for each card from ace being one to king being 13. If value string equals a, value equals one, and so on for each card. In the solitaire script, where we deal the cards from the top deck and make them face up, we can also denote the location as being in the top deck in their respective selectable scripts. New top card dot get component of type selectable dot in deck pile equals true. Before adding any more logic, we can take the opportunity to test out the changes. So we can make this always return false and play the scene. Selecting the Jack of Hearts from the hierarchy, we can see that the selectable script associated with the Jack of Hearts knows that its suit is H for hearts. Its value is 11 and that it is face up and in the deck pile. The same is true of the Ace of Clubs. Its suit is C, value is one, it is face up and not in the deck pile. The row value being zero is wrong though, and this is because we have not yet assigned this with a value. We can do this when the card is dealt out. Within the solitaire deal method of the solitaire script, we can add a line inside the iterative loop. New card dot get component of type selectable dot row equals i. Back on the user input script, the snackable method now has some variables it can compare. As we have access to the selectable script attached to the card in slot one, and the card is most recently selected, we can compare the suits and their values. So, if they're in the top pile, they must stack suited ace to king, and if they're in the bottom pile, they must stack alternate colors king to ace. We'll handle the top logic first, as it is a little easier. If S2, the most recently selected card's selectable script dot top is true, then we are attempting to move a card to the top position. If the suits match, if S1 dot suit equals S2 dot suit, or if the card in slot one is an ace and the newly selected object is an empty space with no suit yet assigned to it, or S1.value is equal to one and S2.suit is equal to null, if the value of the second card is one more than the first, then return true. If S1.value is equal to S2.value plus one, return true, else return false. If we were attempting to stack on the bottom first, we would similarly check if the values align only in the reverse direction. If s1.value is equal to s2.value minus one, then we can return true only if the colors alternate red to black. To test the card colors, we can create a couple of quick bools, card one red equals true and card two red equals true. If s1.suit is equal to c or s, then card one red is false, it's a black card. If s2.suit is equal to c or s, then card two red is false, it's a black card. Therefore, if card one red is equal to card two red, either they are both red or both black, in which case we can print not stackable and return false. Else the cards are different colors, we already know the values are correct, and we can print stackable and return true. Lastly, I'll put a catch or return false at the end here, as if we add more logic, I want to make sure that there's always a way out of the method. Back to the top, we can now implement the new stackable method. If a stackable selected, then stack it, else select it. Saving and testing, we can see that the five of spades is stackable on the six of diamonds, but not on the ace of hearts. As our logic is working, now we need to implement the stack move itself. That's it for part four. Next time we will look at extending card interactivity to get to the point where we can move cards to the foundation or top row and technically play a full game of solitaire. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit like, please hit subscribe and feel free to leave a message in the comments. I'll catch you next time.